Well, around 1200 BCE, three major civilizations collapsed all around the same time. Uh, of course, you had the new kingdom of ancient Egypt. Uh, it started its decline uh, during this time. You had the kingdom of the Hittites of central Anatolia. And, of course, you have the Mycenaeans of mainland Greece. But you also have a whole bunch of other, like Mitanni, other little kingdoms uh, in uh, the Near East that also collapse at this time. As a result, when they fell, the entire Eastern Mediterranean succumbed to a, a dark age where once vast cities became tiny villages or wiped out altogether. Trade routes collapsed. Uh, in some regions, all knowledge of writing was forgotten. There was constant war and violence, which became a way of life again. Uh, this all happened with the fall of the Bronze Age cultures. Uh, Robert uh, Drews writes that within a period of 40 or 50 years, at the end of the 13th and the beginning of the 12th century, almost every significant city in the Eastern Mediterranean world was destroyed, many of them never to be occupied again. Whoa, so huge disaster. It's the end of civilization as we know it. At least they thought so. So what happened, right? What could possibly cause three of the most powerful civilizations of ancient times to fall around the same era? The answer is, it's a combination, but there is one aspect that stands out. Many of the ancient documents say that the sea peoples, the sea peoples were the ones that caused this decline and destruction. They were for many years, a very mysterious and, and forgotten group of people. They were known uh, as great warriors. Uh, they somehow, somehow, managed to single-handedly change the entire known world. The sea people waged war with everyone in the Eastern Mediterranean, and the devastation is obvious, both from literary as well as the archaeological evidence. The archaeologist by the name of Ebenhard Zanger uh, has dubbed this conflict as World War Zero. Some scholars even now believe that the Trojan War of Homer constituted one of the final battles against the Sea Peoples by the Mycenaeans before their own subsequent fall. But before this catastrophe, the late Bronze Age world of the Eastern Mediterranean and throughout the Fertile Crescent was one of the most advanced cosmopolitan. Uh, cultures before, incomparable, uh, I mean, beyond belief from any era before it, uh, with not only the ancient Egyptians or the Hittites and the Mycenaeans at their heightened power, as well as prestige, but also a series of prosperous smaller states in Syro-Palestine. And so I want to mention before I jump into this, I want to mention that I'm going to be using uh, a lot of cutting edge information. What I mean by that? is that uh, I have racked my brain going through recent sources and articles that are all the way up to date. And so when it comes to the Sea Peoples, uh, where for so often we don't know, uh, they would say we don't know who they are. I'm sorry, but we know who they are. A, a few of the sources uh, that I use, I just wanna kind of show you them. Uh, starting from uh, the the earliest one here, uh, right here uh, is of course uh, edited by Craig Melkart, uh, and this particular work here is from 2003, uh, 
uh, published by Brill, and it's known as the Luvians. So I have this one. The second one is 10 years later from 2013, and it is known as Luvian Identities. And then, of course, uh, we become even more contemporaneous, uh, and we get here to 2016, and Luian Civilization by Evenhart Zenger. However, at the same time, um, I went ahead and just spent my time racking through JSOR and other academic articles. And so I kind of have, I do have, articles that bring us all the way up to, well, 2023. So what the information I'm going to give you, of course, a few years, this will be dated, is all the way to what we know about the Sea Peoples uh, up to 2023 in academia. The problem is, is that information is going to take a while to get to everybody else. So while most people are going, oh, wow, I wonder who the the, the sea peoples are. Uh, a lot of academics are, you know who they are. <laughs> what are you guys doing? <laughs> so uh, that's what I'm going to be revealing to you in this talk. So we're at the height of the Bronze Age. Late Bronze Age is a great time. And there, of course, the Egyptians are doing well. Let's start with ancient Egypt. One of the greatest pharaohs of Egyptian history, without doubt, was Ramses II, master builder, great conqueror, and shrewd diplomat. Let's take a look at his picture. <laughs> um, his legacy is beyond dispute, but apparently <laughs> he looks right here less of Ramses the Great and more like Ramses the Minor. <laughs> so I don't know what happened there. Uh, he would not like this image. Because uh, he liked to have statues of himself larger than life. And this is just like a thumbnail. But uh, in fact, uh, let's take down that picture. Thank you, Margie, uh, for indulging me on that one. Um, now, many believe that it was during this time that uh, the Pharaoh, uh, the time of Pharaoh that Moses uh, led the Jewish people out of Egypt and on to Israel, uh, boldly telling Ramses to let my people go. Ramses had a, a very long life, uh, born around 1303 BCE, depending on the calendar dates, and dying sometime around 1213. And so living around about 90 years of age, his reign was also extremely long, ascending to the throne fully, in 1279, and so ruling about 66 years. So, so it's pretty easy uh, when we talk about the 13th century uh, in in, a, um, in Egypt. You say, "Oh, so who is Pharaoh then?" And basically, uh, you see Ramses, and that's pretty much a large chunk of it is under him. Okay, so um, before this time, by the way, uh, when he was 14, he was the regent for his father, Seti I. So his actually his reign goes back even earlier into that century. Uh, uh, he built great uh, constructions at the site of Avaris on the Nile Delta, once the capital of the Hyksus uh, during the Second Intermediate Period. Ramses built his own city known as Pi Ramses. Beautiful, huge, enormous uh, city that had 30, 300 a uh, thousand people and covered about 6.9 square miles. Pretty huge. Ramses is also known for his various military accomplishments, winning victories and gaining territories uh, from the Nubians, and of course, pushing back, <laughs> maybe, uh, the Hittites, uh, securing Egyptian claimed lands, which eventually culminates in the famous Battle of Kadesh. But it appears that early on in his reign, I mean, it is during his reign, Ramses was already encountering those who will soon be known as the Sea People. Almost immediately, Ramses uh, was uh, out fighting against the various foes of Egypt when he started his reign, uh, starting out, in fact, his second year of his reign against those known as the Sheridan Pirates, the Sheridan Pirates. Uh, so they are already pirates. Uh, these are the Sea Peoples. Let's take a look at the next picture. And we'll take a look there and we'll see what they look like. So the Egyptians have left an image behind of what they look like here. 
Uh, so here we go. Hopefully the image is not too small. It's kind of small. Let's see if the next one's bigger. There we go. Yes, the Sheridan Pirates. Okay, keep that up a little bit there. Um, now, uh, they were basically pillaging ships en route uh, for Egypt, also known as the Shardana. These people uh, were uh, from around the southwest coast of Anatolia. Uh, although some will say that the uh, southwest coast up to the mid coast of Ionia and uh, Shardana could be a derivative of the word Sardis. Now they often wore so these, they, 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 and they are known as Luvians. Now we say it sometimes we say Luvians, and sometimes we say Luvians. Either way will work. So these are Luvians. Okay. And you can see here they often wore the characteristic horned helmets with a, a ball that's between the horns. In many ways, uh, their helmets and armor resembled that of the Philistines. But as it turns out, the Philistines were also uh, believed to be part of the Sea Peoples. Let's go to the next image. The Sheridan uh, uh, also enlarged the uh, what's called the European short dagger and made it able to withstand heavy attacks, including chariot attacks, which proved devastating to both the Egyptians and Hittites alike, who both used chariots as a key component of warfare. Ramses uh, decided to send some cargo vessels out into their usual pirating areas uh, before the Nile Delta and decided to wait for them to see if they would take the bait. Suddenly, according to a steely uh, located at Tanis, Ramses and his soldiers appeared in their warships from the midst of the sea, and none were able, it was said, to be able to stand before them. But what is most curious, Ramses then makes many of the Shardana, who are sea people, will be identified as sea people, he'll make the Shardana into mercenaries to be employed in his war against various other aggressors, most especially against the Hittites. Yet Ramses also fought and defeated another group known as the seagoing Luca. Let's go to the next image. And so these are images here, the Luca, as well as those known as the Sheklish people, again, uh, both groups of these were later identified as being the Sea People. It is then clear that already by the 1270s, the Sea People were on the rise, acting as pirates for the most part. Again, you could see that right there. Uh, isn't that interesting? Okay, you can take that down. Thank you so much. So, in the in the fourth year of his reign. Uh, Ramses began his foray into Canaan. While Steely discovered at Beirut describes his campaign, uh, unfortunately, it is badly mutilated, and so much information is, is difficult to interpret. We know that Ramses fought directly against uh, one Canaanite prince who was already uh, hit by an archer's arrow and mortally wounded, and uh, that this was uh, the opposing army was defeated. We can also discern from the inscription that Ramses captured all the princes of Canaan and sent them all back to Egypt as political hostages. And finally, we learn from the stele that Ramses' main military headquarters in Canaan was located at Ribla, currently on the northern border of Israel, about 35 miles northeast of Baalbek. Now, we also... Uh, know conclusively that some of the sea peoples were originally allies of the Egyptians and as we, as I said and even hired as mercenaries under Ramses the second this as I said the sea people known as the Sheridan were enlisted as the mercenaries of the Egyptians to fight against 
the Hittites. More interestingly still, the Sea Peoples, known as the Lukka, L-U-K-K-A, fought as mercenaries on the side of the Hittites. Now we can see what's going to be going on here, right? <laughs> well, so this is basically what the battle is. So, so, so you have the Hittites versus the Egyptians, sort of, <laughs> indirectly, in the various battles. What will happen is while the native Egyptians and Hittites, they happen to fight from the chariots, the sea peoples, these mercenaries, fought as foot soldiers with, the, with their swords, literally fighting one another for, for pay. So basically you have this. You got the, the Egyptians and their chariots here, and you have the Sheridan there as the foot soldiers, and they're fighting across the way, <laughs> the Luca, who are the foot soldiers, and the Hittites, who are on their chariots. And so what happened is, Basically, uh, the you know the Egyptians and the Hittites are watching their higher mercenaries fight each other, <laughs> you know. And if the battle is not going very well for one or, and or the other, uh, what will happen if it's not going well for the Egyptians? Uh, the the sons of the Egyptians get to escape because they're going to ride free on their chariots. Or it's not going very well uh, for the the Hittite mercenaries who are the Luka. Then what will happen is. The, Luke, the, the, the Hittites will, will flee in their chariots. And so basically, they got used to it. Just let's have the mercenaries fight. Uh, and we kind of, we're tired of our people being ground under. Let's just use them. Well, you can see this is not going to be a great policy ultimately, because it creates a culture, a mercenary culture, where after a while, after a few decades, uh, this culture, they get used to attacking the enemy you know rape pillage murder whatever it may be and of course the uh egyptians the hittites don't get their don't get their hands as dirty during the fifth year of ramses the second the determined pharaoh pushed forward into syria and towards the coveted city of kadesh which was only captured once and tentatively before uh, before by the Egyptians and was constantly the launching point for the various enemies of the Egyptians, especially uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Hittites. In 1274, in what would be known as the Battle of Kadesh, the Hittites ambushed Ramses' army as their chariots suddenly rushed out upon them. And it looked like all was lost until Ramses, according to the story, uh, managed to gather his scattered forces together and fight back. Inscriptions from Luxor continue this story. It says, His Majesty slaughtered the armed forces of the Hittites in their entirety. Do I believe that? Of course not. I don't think Ramses did that, but he likes himself uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, that's how that works. Uh, their great rulers and all their brothers, their infantry and chariot troops fell prostrate, one on top of the other. His majesty killed them, and they lay stretched out in front of their horses, but his majesty was alone. Nobody accompanied him. <laughs> right. So, so so, by himself, <laughs> Ramses <laughs> defeated the uh, He just can't make this up. That guy's ego. Oh, man, no wonder he had huge statues of himself all over the place. Okay, so... Uh, the Battle of Kadesh was, in reality, not the great victory uh, that, that Ramses made it up to be. It was really a draw uh, between the Egyptians and the Hittites. Yet, with that said, the ramifications of this battle appear to be more in favor of actually the Hittites. Uh, for much of Syria, uh, Syria now became solidified under their control, with the uh, Egyptians relegated to Palestine. But around the sixth year of his reign, even Palestine uh, 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 had some, some situations there. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, we lost some pages here. Give me a few seconds here. What pages uh, got, got lost underfoot? 
here we go. Give me a few seconds here. Don't you love what I started? I think I dropped my pages before I came out here. Turn page four, five, six, seven. There we go. All is good. I'm just glad it printed out. <laughs> I drove with my printer today too. <laughs> that was another fun bit. Okay. Okay. So appear to be a draw. But in the sixth year of his reign, even Palestine began to erupt in revolt, most likely encouraged via the intrigue of the Hittites. And so uh, Ramses had to return. Uh, in response to this rebellion of Palestine, Ramses has divided, uh, decided to divide his forces in two uh, with his son, Amun Her Kishif, taking, uh, taking focus on the southern Canaan while he concentrated his army on the central region. Uh, let's go to the next picture. Let's see, I think there's something interesting there. Yeah, so so this is, of course, there's Kadesh. Uh, sorry, the map is so small. You can see it's, you have the Hittites on one side and you have uh, the Egyptians in yellow on the other side. So it's a pivotal place. Uh, if, if This is, of course, along near alongside the Jezreel Valley area or region. So if you can control this area, of course, Megiddo, Valley of Armageddon, anybody, you control much of the Middle East. Let's go to the next image. Uh, this is Kadesh right here. Oh, this is a great uh, image. I can see the site uh, as it looks like. Let's go to the next image. Yes, uh, this is the Shasu. So what happened is, is Amon Her Kerpshif, uh, focused on the southern Canaan while he concentrated his army on the central region. His son focused on repelling the troublesome Shasu. This is based on an image that was found. These are tribal peoples who worshipped a god by the name of, according to Egyptian records, by the name of Yahweh, pursuing them across the Negev Desert and to the Dead Sea. Next, he captured Edom Seir. Finally, he captured Moab. As for Ramses II, he, is first, he first captured Jerusalem, then Jericho, before joining his son in Moab. Next, Ramses and his son headed north, reaching and capturing first Hezbon, then Damascus, and then of course, uh, moving all the way to the edge of Syria, but Syria looted them. Okay, so what happens here, okay, thank you for that image. What happens is, and I'm describing it, is that basically there's a deadlock. The Egyptians, the Hittites, were just fighting over the same area. And so in 1258, Ramses II of Egypt and King uh, Hattusilu III met at Kadesh to draw up a peace treaty. This is the first surviving peace treaty in world history. Now, so this is it. Peace. We got peace. Peace is our time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chamberlain. The Hittites claimed, of course, that the Egyptians begged uh, for this peace treaty, while the Egyptians claimed that it was actually the Hittites who were desperate for peace uh, and wished to conclude the hostilities. Uh, the Egyptian treaty was placed on a silver plaque, brought back to Karnak, and then carved into the walls to preserve it for all posterity. <laughs> the treaty uh, claims that both the Egyptian and Hittite gods wanted this peace to come about. After this treaty, there is no more evidence that the Egyptians were in conflict with the Hittites or their allies. In other words, the Treaty of Kadesh was effective. According to a surviving papyrus record from the latter part of Ramses II's reign, it appears that the city of Sumer, just north of the city of Byblos, was the northernmost area held by the Egyptians along the Phoenician coast. Of course, there's a problem. The problem is, is that the sea people were the mercenaries. They're no longer employed uh, now that the peace had commenced between the Egyptians and the Hittites. I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, um, you know, idle hands are are are, are the are the tool of Tammuz, but I, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, this is not a good situation having these all these unemployed mercenaries 
who, by the way, were know um, all the strategies and uh, geographical locations and topography of their uh, former uh, employers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like and so uh so yeah so there's a there's this is one of the contributing factors uh to unrest uh amongst the luca and the sheridan i guess there's nothing else to do but just continue what we used to do but in a more effective way because of our trained as mercenaries and that of course is being privateers <laughs> pirates <laughs> so uh you know i believe in peace i do i absolutely do but uh, uh maybe they should have uh, kind of weaned off these mercenaries in another way you know <laughs> give them some kind of like a like a maybe like some kind of job placement <laughs> you know to help them uh, settle in with the transition that basically didn't have that in, in ancient times so so meanwhile so you can understand uh this is the this is the this is the beginning of the mess. Ramses, of course, uh, during this period of time, uh, towards the end of his reign, as you would expect, uh, their former in, in employees are starting to wreak havoc uh, throughout uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so when he died at the age of ninety, uh, already uh, things are starting to fall apart uh, gradually. Uh, towards the end of his reign so uh, so what happens is that because his father Ramses II had reigned such a long time when Mernetef came to the throne he was nearly 60 years old with most of his brothers and heir parents long dead <laughs> so uh, Mernetef spent most of his 10-year rule from August of, tw of tw 1213 to May 2nd of 1203, attempting to fight the Sea Peoples. Yeah, there, there we are. We're already there. The Sea People are at it. So it's sort of getting bad towards dad in a dad's reign. Now it's getting it's it's bad. It's this is this is awful. Uh so theories about the identity of the Sea People are quite diverse indeed. Who are they? And often contradict one another. But that is quickly changing. In fact, the difficulty concerning their identity has actually led to certain schools of thought, which we'll go into. Uh, emerging at the end of the reign of Ramses II, the Sea Peoples harassed the Egyptians from the reign of Meredith, 1213 to 1203, through the reign of Ramses III, which is 1186 to 11, uh, 1155. This is basically that's a long time. So the, this is, so they're 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 going to be causing problems uh, for quite a few generations. To understand the Sea Peoples from the Egyptian point of view, scholars typically focus on four different main sources. <clears throat> First, they examine what is known as the Manitou Stele. But what is actually known as the Hymn of Victory, referring to this Pharaoh's defeat of the Sea Peoples off the coast of the Nile Delta uh, in the year 1208. The next evidence arise from the descriptive and pictorial representations of the Sea Peoples uh, from the uh, Medinet Habu, which is uh, the from the mortuary temple of Ramses III, located in Thebes in Upper Egypt. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, another source, and that is the Papyrus Harris, written only after 20 years of following the victory of Ramses III against the Sea Peoples around 1179 BCE. There are now, so that's the, that's the sources. There are four theories of where of who the Sea People are. I'm going to answer that question pretty pretty soon. So, but let's go into the theories. The first theory is Leonard Cottrell's theory, author of the, the Warrior Pharaohs in 1968. He proposed in 1969 that the Sea People arrived from all around the Mediterranean. They're from all around the Mediterranean, but especially Anatolia. 
and the islands of the Aegean Sea, and he also mentions Sicily. So that's the first one. He said, however, they were not native to the southern Levant, which, of course, is Palestine, Israel, nor were they connected to Egypt in any way. So that's his theory. The second theory uh, came about in 1975 by uh, Alessandra Nibi. Uh, her, the, the work is called uh, Sea Peoples in Egypt. He, uh, there was a pr proposition of the opposite, that the sea people were from and exclusively from the southern Levant or Palestine, Israel, and Egypt, specifically the area around the Nile Delta. In addition, there were some that's from uh, Libya. Uh, Libya uh, basically denies any possibility they're from anywhere else. That's the second one. The third theory uh, is from 1985. It's Ann Sanders, which is kind of asserted a more of a middle way between Cottrell and Nibby, believing like Nibby that some of the sea people did indeed arrive out of the southern Levant region, but also believing like Cottrell that they also came from Anatolia, the Aegean, and even possibly Italy, kind of the middle. As of the last decade, most scholars agreed the sea peoples uh, well, they did come from Anatolia. Let's go. Let's go to the fourth theory, though. The fourth theory was proposed in 2014 by Eberhard Zenger. That's that's his book right there. Uh, a Swiss a geoarchaeologist received his PhD from Stanford University, uh, and he's the one who presents compelling evidence that while the Sea People were made of many groups from different places, the main body of them were from Anatolia, and they were Luwian. In short, he suggests that they were likely a coalition of petty uh, kingdoms uh, that came together uh, for this particular point of, uh, you know, and um, an objective. And it came together, of course, in Western Anatolia. Now, for the most part, where are we going to go with this this, this talk? For the most part, the four, the four, four theory has emerged as the dominant theory. That, I mean, it's, it'll be really obvious in a little bit, that the majority of the sea people are Luwian, and they are from Anatolia, specifically in western and southern Anatolia along the coastal regions. We know this through contemporary writings. We know this from archaeological evidence because uh, Luwian studies are really opening up. With that said, there still happens to be a few other groups that joined this coalition that seem to be from various islands about the Mediterranean, um, uh, maybe even Sicily, maybe even Sardinia, but the bulk of them are from Anatolia. We also uh, know conclusively that some of the sea people, as I said before, were originally allies of the Egyptians and they were hired as mercenaries, as I mentioned before. And we know them, of course, by name. We know as the, the Sheridan, right, on the Egyptian side, and the Luca on the other side, because those exact names, those exact names will appear on lists later on of who the sea people are. They tell us who the sea people are. They, they tell us their names. <laughs> and there it is. And we know who the Luca are. We know who the Sheridan are now. Okay, so the first sea people mentioned by name during the time of Ramses II, I'll give you the names, uh, emeritus, were the Shardana, which are connected to, of course, obviously the area of, of Ionia and a little further south and, and Sardis. You got the Luca are mentioned. You got the Teresh. You got the Sheklish. You got the Sheridan. And you have the Equish. So these are names that are specifically used for them. As I mentioned before, of course, the, the Sheridan connected uh, to Anatolia uh, in the southwestern region, and they are Luvian. 
they are they are the, the Luwian people. The, the, the next one is a little interesting. The Equish. Some people say that the Equish uh, are the Ahiwa. Equish Ahiwa, who of course are Ahiwas connected to Ahian, and Ahian is connected to Ikwash. And so they will say that the Ikwash are actually Greeks, uh, Mycenaean Greeks. You see the connection? So Ahiwa, right, uh, becomes Ikwash. Which becomes Achian, and so uh, and so, and we know that uh, for for a fact uh, that the Mycenaeans were colonizing the coast of Ionia. So we have some there here. The Sea Peoples, uh, uh, the one that that seems to be maybe from from um, Sicily, were the Sheklish. They will say connected to the Sickles of Sicily, but the big ones, of course. Uh, are the Luca, as and of course the Sheridan, which we talked about the Sheridana, but the Luca are mentioned a lot. They are mentioned a whole lot. We know all about the Luca. The the Luca are always mentioned as being the Sea People. So hey, let's take this thread. Okay, we we understand the Luca. We know who the Sea People are because that's one of the Sea People, and we know exactly who they are. It's no longer a mystery. It's over. <laughs> okay, so here we go. The Luca. Uh, Luca are absolutely are Luwian. Luwian and Luca, Luca and Luwian. So the, the general group of people are called Luwians, and this specific group are called the Luca of the Luwians. They are connected. The word Luca is connected to the word Lycia. Luca, you take you take the the u sound becomes a y sound, and you got the you see how you can just transliterate it over to Lycia. Lycia, of course, is located uh, in uh, southern Anatolia, southern Turkey today. They provided the bulk of the sea peoples. Uh, now, many scholars have noted that in some cases, the designation Luca refers to an area specifically uh, approximating. What is now the coastal regions of Lycia and Pamphylia up to Para, which is Perge. But in other cases, uh, sometimes used in a more general sense, referring to the land of the Luwians in general. So the word Luca can refer to a particular region, but it also can refer to being used as another name for the Luwians. It's just like another name. Uh, of course, the Luca lands, the center of those areas is the Xanthos Valley, and they even possess even as much parts of Caria as well. So we know where they're from. I just told you where to find them. <laughs> so let's, let's take a look. Let's take a look. So now we've already identified one of the sea peoples, the, the major one, the big one. <laughs> so let's learn about them. Why not, right? Luca. According to Hittite records, while the Luca allied themselves with the Hittites at times, they were in conflict and rebelled against their authority at other times. So let's, what do we find the first time we encounter the Luca? Who we 100% know are sea people. <laughs> so oh, that's, that's great, you know, now knowing all this. The first time we encountered their name, the Luca, they are part of an anti- Hittite confederacy known as the Asua League or the Asuan Confederacy, uh, as referred to by Tudhalia the first in the early 14th century BCE. Uh, so it's listed, uh, the Luca are listed as those who are part of this Asua League. By the way, the word Asua uh, will be later on connected to the word Asue. Isaiah, and of course, it's the root for the word Asia, as in the continent of Asia. That's where it comes from. Anyway, uh, also located part of this uh, this confederacy, part of this this group uh, beyond the Luca. They mention, of course, the Tarusa and the Wailusia. The Wailusia, of course, is Walusa. That's Troy. And, of course, Tarusa is connected to the region around it. 
So uh, it's interesting, right? So the Trojans are part of this anti uh, uh, league against uh, the. Uh, I know you're looking at me like Walusa doesn't even look doesn't sound like the word Troy. Troy. Well, first of all, uh, uh, Troy was the territory that was governed. The Troad, Troas. It's a it's the territory, and the main town. Uh, was Walusa, Walusa, Walusa. Now, what will happen uh, is that the W sound will disappear from Greek, uh, and it will be an I Lusa. So, be I Lusa because it loses its 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 its, its W sound uh, during the the Greek Dark Ages. So, it becomes I Lusa, which of course is the stem for the word Iliad. And of course, the, the Iliad, right? And Ilium as the name of the town. Got it? <laughs> so today, uh, we have things kind of confused. Uh, we have, of course, uh, we call the city Troy. Uh, and that's kind of like, uh, uh, it's kind of confusing. It's 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 kind of like a calling Sacramento, California. <laughs> so you got it? Yeah, so, so yeah, so we're loose. Uh, uh, and it's interesting because the Homeric pattern uh, in meter, uh, apparently, the W jumped out of there uh, uh, only after uh, it was going through oral tradition. And so that means that it's a little off because uh, there's this need to have this consonant that's no longer there uh, in the name of that town. Cool, huh? So, yes. So, so Troy is already appearing in these records. And, of course, I want to bring up the fact that the Trojans are Luwians. And so they are related to the to the Luca. You're seeing these connections. Uh, once again, the word Luca can be used for a specific group that is located uh, uh, in the area of, of southern Anatolia. And it also can be used as a general name uh, for these Luwians uh, in western and southern Anatolia. In fact, I, maybe we have a map. Let's see if we take, let's see, take a look at the map here. Uh, let's see the next image. If not, Yes, there you are. All right, there is. So, so you see here, uh, so you see the, the connection here. There's the Luca right there. Uh, that is, of course, Lycia. You have the Carcissa, okay, right? That's Caria. Um, our, our Zawa, right? Uh, which, which, which will have a connection. Uh, they'll have a Nazarwa league that will be destroyed by the Hatti, the Hittites over there. Um, Dardana, Dardanelles, right? Masa. And between Dardania and Massa, you'll have uh, the area of, of, of the um, uh, Walusa. Let's go to the next image. I think we have another even more compelling one. There you go. See, there it is. So take a look here. Uh, this one's a, a more academic one. But you see down there, uh, you see the word Luca. That's where the Luca are from. You can see how they are are close uh, to, uh, there's Cyprus right there. Cyprus is Alasia right there. So Luca right there, you see Para, which is Perge, and uh, it's on the border of Tarhuntasis, right? You have Carissa, which is Caria there. You have Latmos. Oh, there is there is uh, Milawanda. Milawanda is ancient Miletus, ancient Miletus. You know where all the great philosophers are from it was what's a luwian city apasa you know apasa is that's right that is the city of ephesus because ephesus was also a luwian city these are all luwians and apasa was the capital of what was known as the arzawa region you go a little bit further north and you go further up and you see ah oh, there it is troy and look there's walusa right there so these are, a lot of these uh, are identified uh, as sea people. <laughs> so specifically the Walusa uh, and the Luca in, in this particular breath. Is that helpful? Is it kind of neat to see the placement of everybody? Okay, um, go to the next one. I don't think there's another map there, though. Just want to see. Oh, yes, this is beautiful. This is what uh, ancient uh, Lycia or the land of the Luca looks like. Isn't that beautiful? It's perfect though, because uh, look at the, look at the topography. You got mountainous, and you have all of these harbors, natural harbors going in, which is perfect. 
not only for shipping, but for pirates. <laughs> you can always easily escape, uh, you know, in one of those bays and wait things out. So what will happen is the Luca way before, way before the time of the sea people were already understood as notorious pirates. <laughs> All right. That's great. Thank you. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of them. Okay. So let's learn about the Luca. So we're, we're, we're already diving in and learning directly about the sea people uh, through the Luca. So, but let's find out what they're like beforehand, right? Okay, as I mentioned, they're part of the Asua uh, uh, League, uh, as mentioned by uh, Tudhalia, and of course I mentioned Troy. According to a letter, a letter uh, EA, actually go to the next image, I'm sorry Margie, because uh, we ha actually have a picture of EA letter, discovered amongst the Amarna archives in Egypt. There it is! Uh, this is a letter. According to this letter, the king of Cyprus which is Alasia, complained to the pharaoh Akhenaten, uh, who reigned between 1353 to 1336, that the land of Luca was attacking various villages on his island every year. <laughs> they are pirates. I know. There is the evidence right there from the Amarna EA. You're looking at it right there in Cuneiform. As noted by Trevor uh, Bryce, they had now uh, extended their free booting activities to Egypt, thereby causing some tension in Egypt's relation with Alicia, which is Cyprus. The Alicean king, king's letter was apparently written in response uh, to accusations by a Akhenaten that his subjects were acting in collaboration with the Luca people, that the Cypriots are collaborating with the Luca to cause hardship on the Egyptians. The letter confirms that the Luca territory included a shoreline, which is, of course, the Anatolian southern coast, from which pirates have been launching their regular expeditions against the coastal cities and obviously, no doubt, shipping in the eastern Mediterranean. In this respect, they foreshadow the activities that were later to become. Uh, so there you have it. Let's go to the next image. During the reign of the Hittite uh, king by the name of uh, Mersili the uh, first, reign from 1330 to 1295. Here we go, more on the Luca. The Luca were said to uh, denounce their gods. Specifically, the Hittite sun goddess known as Arina. So we find this uh, in a um, prayer to the sun goddess that Mussolini uh, uh, pronounces and has inscribed. So let's 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 hear his prayer. So he says as follows: He says, "Moreover, those countries which belong to the land of the Hatti, namely the land of Casca." Also the land of Arwana, the land of Kalisma, the land of Luca, the land of Padassa. These lands have also renounced the sun goddess of Arena. Now all the surrounding countries have begun to attack the land of Hatti. Those are being the Hittites. Let it again become a matter of concern to the sun goddess of Arana. Oh, God, bring not your name in disrepute. There we go, right? Uh, uh, many have designated that uh, the land of Luca also refers to the Luwians in general. So it's in use interchangeably. So, of course, the question is, when it comes to the Egyptian understanding of them, is it a localized version that's an area of Lycia? Or is it the general area of all of um, of the Air Luca lands of the um, all the um, the land of the um, Luwians uh, in 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 western as well as southern Anatolia. What happens is uh, the answer is they will they will say that earlier on it's specifically just those in Lycia, 
but in, in later on, sometimes it's generally used for Luwians, so in, for the whole region there. So there it is. Um, go to the next one. So um, there's a yet, uh, there's another reference here um, in what's called the, um, Ale it's called the Alexandu Treaty. The Alexandu Treaty, it dates from 1280, which was between the Hittites and the city of Troy. And look, we have, actually have a chance to see uh, some of the Luwian part of the city of, of, of Troy. Uh, so this is, of course, the spring uh, that is mentioned in Hittite records as being in Troy, this underground spring. So you are seeing it. Yes, the Hittites have records of all this. So, uh, so basically, the city of Troy is under the king by the name of Alexandu. <laughs> Alexandu, does that sound familiar? Yeah, it's clearly a form of the work Alexander. Yes, and of course, Alexander connected to Paris. And this is again, this is in the uh, Alexandu Treaty that dates from 1280, which we do have. It mentions that a possible campaign could be launched from a city of the Lucca, uh, revealing that at this time, at least, part of the Lucca region was under the Hittites. Also, most scholars have concluded that Troy herself was not only populated by the Luwians at this time, but even considered a sacred homeland, as we find in one of the Luwian religious hymns uh, from uh, southern Anatolia, uh, from the from the Lucca uh, region. So yeah, Troy uh, is is kind of like the homeland. We can even trace the pottery as uh, Luwian pottery as it spreads from this particular area. That's pretty amazing. Let's go to the next image. Uh, that's what Troy used to look like, but not that small in the picture. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the next one. Okay, so the next one, it's, not, it's very small, so we won't stay very long on this one. Uh, but that is, of course, King, uh, the Hittite king by the name of Hutasili III. So we'll take that picture down. It's too small. So from fragments um, of, the, uh, of the Hittite king uh, Hattusili III, we can gather that a series of raids against the Luka region were at least partially successful by the Hittites. Uh, in fact, uh, various names of places connected to Luca lands, specifically in Lycia, Pisidia, Laconia, and Isuaria, are to be found. So there is an attack on them by the Hittites. Yet, according to another source, uh, it's called the Tawagalawa. <laughs> I'm not joking. The Tawagalawa. Yeah. That's spelled T-A-W-A-G-A-L-A-W-A. -A -A -A. You guys can't make this up. If you're searching for a baby name for your kid, why don't you try out Tawa Galaawa? Yeah, why don't you want that? <laughs> a little tata. <laughs> anyway, the funny thing is, is it's 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 actually written uh, by uh, Hutusili the third. Uh, the, the Luca are again causing problems in this. Again, uh, Hutasili III, he reigned from 1275 to 1245. They're causing problems. Are you getting already the picture that the Luca are problematic? <laughs> of course, they're going to be part of the Sea Peoples. Uh, uh, what happens is the Luca men, they called them the Luca men, uh, had not only approached Hutasili III of the Hittites, but for some reason, that uh, that the of course this this uh, particular source is fragmentary condition in the document, but they also approached uh, oh well, uh, Tawa Galaawa, <laughs> Tawa <laughs> Tawa Galaawa uh, just happens to be the brother of the Ahiwan king. Ahiwans are the Mycenaeans, the Mycenaean Greeks. In other words, <laughs> uh, uh, it looks like the Luca are playing both sides. Uh, 
yes, uh, the, the Hittites and the Mycenaean Greeks going back and forth. Uh, and so there is also another possibility. There is a certain uh, Paya Maradu. Uh, and uh, there was what happened is, is that he captured a group known as the Namrames. And, uh, and so they needed to be liberated. And so uh, some uh, of these were, were liberated and they ended up with the Hittites, we think, and some ended up with the Mycenaeans. And so the Luwians, uh, who are, the, in this case, the Luca, are trying to figure out uh, how to get uh, these people back, maybe, possibly. But we don't know for a fact, for sure. Still, we, we do have the indecision. <laughs> and that is that the Luca are appealing to both the Hittites and the Mycenaeans. And so you can see they're causing some trouble because the Mycenaeans and Hittites hate each other. And so they're playing off the two major foes in the region against each other. You can see this is going to be pretty interesting as it unpacks. Now, under uh, Tudahalia, the fourth, who reigned from 1245 to 1215, 1245 to 1215, so we're kind of getting close to the time where the Luwians go crazy. Uh, and of course, the Lucas as well. The Luca were receiving support by the Ahiawans or the Mycenaeans against the Hittites, uh, creating much anarchy uh, in the region. So it looks like there's some allies here. Although um, uh, we we do know that, um, that that maybe the Luca, as referred to here, is a reference to the uh, a general term that will be applied to the Luwians because they mentioned the Siha Riverland, which is not around Lycia. But what happens is the Hittite king marches upon the Luwians or Luca, whatever you want to call them, uh, captures the vassal king, Tarhundara, and returns home with a line of prisoners and 500 teams of horses. Also, King uh, Tudalahia was involved in helping a certain King Walmu of Walusa, which is Troy, helping him regain his throne after being deposed. There's another Troy reference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many scholars attribute this to the Mycenaeans, the Greeks, but other Lucan involvement is not out of question. The king's letter also refer, refers back to a time where uh, Payu Maradu invaded the land of Walusa and occupied it. And of course, Paya Maradu was often connected with the Mycenaeans. So it looks like Troy uh, is, you know, under uh, under Luvians and it's under the Hittites, and it's under the Mycenaeans, and then it's under the Hittites, and then it's under themselves, Luvians, and then under the Mycenaeans again, and then under the Hittites. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and we can document it. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's nice that we have these records. It's too bad that, you know, uh, nobody ever reads them, <laughs> except for people like me, but you're gathering this information. So, yeah. Of course, Troy exists, but Troy also, we have the history of Troy being put together right here. Okay, so what happens now is that the Luca are causing lots of problems. Uh, later on, uh, the Luca, obviously, they're going to be seizing the island of Cyprus, and you can see why it's so close. I mean, not too far apart. Um, and uh, but there we also have a few others. So a few others on that list. You have, of course, the Terish. The Terish were also from Western Anatolia. Uh, what's interesting is the Terish, maybe, and, and they're Luwians. The Terish may be connected to uh, Terish, Tyronoi, and so and Tyronoi goes into the Tyrrhenians. So they may. Be some, even though uh, when it comes to DNA evidence, some people say that still they're connected to, in some way uh, to the Etruscans. So who knows if they travel from there? Uh, maybe it's a small group of them get together and then they mix with the others uh, in the central part of Italy. Who knows? Uh, but there you have it. Uh, the Egyptian narrative stele uh, refers to these people as the Tursha. 
Uh, so there's a different name there. Uh, so who knows? But the both the Luca and the Terish are still connected to the Luwians. So um, I know you're going to be asking this question. So let's go there. Who are the Luwians? Let's not spend forever on this, but I do want to, we, we need to define things very quickly. First of all, I want you to understand that the Luca and the word Luwian are sometimes interchangeable. However, the Luca is also a particular region in the southern part of Anatolia, uh, which is now known as Lycia. Got it? So that's the problem is they will use these words interchangeably. However, uh, the majority of the sea peoples are still Luwian. Uh, majority are Luwian. We know who they are. We know who they are. They're Luwians. Uh, and so let's find out who the Luwians are in general. Um, okay, so what happens is the Luwians, um, we know that the Luwians uh, were already distinct by the time they were uh, a major part of the population of Troy II between uh, 2,600 2,000 250 so 2600 to 2250 BCE we know that the Luwians were part of of the Walusa they were the Walusa they're in Troy uh around 2350 BCE those who spoke Luwian then began to spread throughout Anatolia uh they introduced a particular kind of pottery known as red slipware and, and then we can tr we can actually trace this pottery uh, south, west, and east, uh, reaching the northern part of Syria during the second millennia. I'll just tell you a little secret. We also discovered this pottery where the appearing in the Nile Delta. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, it's there. So yeah, we have archaeological evidence. According uh, to the Hittite Code, uh, written in Old Hittite, the majority of the area where Luwian speaking peoples live was called Lawuya. And of course, then again, they will, they will suddenly kind of use this word interchangeably with Luka. Uh, that's just the way things are. The Hittites and the Luwians are related to one another. <clears throat> they both came down uh, from uh, Indo Europeans, they came down into Anatolia. It's a controversy sometime during the third millennia. Uh, the Hittites settled about the central plateau region of Anatolia, and the Luwians settled along the, the southern coast and the western coast of Anatolia. Uh, so uh, right there, so that's kind of the configuration. The Hittites, however, uh, they have this kind of supremacy complex. They like them, themselves a lot. And so they kind of treat the Luwians like second-class citizens. Not very well. In fact, they have a whole bunch of laws that are very, they're not equal at all. Where the punishments, if, if a Hittite commits a, a crime, for the same crime, uh, the Luwian will have a steeper fine or or worse punishment. It's just it's ridiculous. Uh, so but so the Hittites are kind of bullies. However, uh, the Hittites, you know, we see in these maps that the Hittites have all of, of Anatolia or at least the, the central western half. That is pure fantasy. Uh, there's only a small periods of time, very small and only lasting in many cases, just uh, maybe a couple decades where the Hittites have all the way uh, to the Aegean. And, or, and hardly ever at all uh, further south along the Mediterranean. So that's just that's just ridiculous. It's not true. And that whole process is being reviewed and changed around. That the Hittites weren't as big a deal as we thought. The Luwians, however, are a very big deal. Okay, so what happens is, is the Luwia is the area where people speak a Luwian language, which is related uh, to Hittite. Uh, and they they write in the symbolic sense, and they also uh, write um, um, in a kanea form. So you have both forms of writing. Throughout the second into the first millennia, Luwian became the dominant language 
of, of Walusa or Troy, a place known as the Siha River Land, uh, along the, the uh, Hermos River and the Calcas Valley, and the Myra Kaulia Kingdom, with its core being the Menander uh, Valley. Also, of course, Arzawa, which is, of course, Apostles versus Ephesus. And, and obviously uh, the area of Lycia, which is Luca, right? Now we do have uh, a corrupt late copy of the Hittite code and the area known as Arzawa, which corresponds to the Mycenaean name for the region, replaces the general term Lawiya, and it describes it as follows. It says you have Arzawa, that's there, what Myra Siwa River land, and then they mention um, what will become eventually Lydia. Uh, they call it Leuia. Uh, by the 14th century BCE, the Luvian speakers came to constitute the majority in the Hittite capital of Hattusas. It appears that by the time of the collapse of the Hittite Empire around 1180 BCE, the Hittite king and royal family were fully bilingual in Luwian. Uh, but Luwian, they actually Luwians continue all the way into the 8th century BCE. Uh, studies of satellite imagery have revealed that we have around uh, 350 uh, large Luwian city-like sites dotting the region that needs to be excavated. Uh, so. Some of these, uh, Zanagar states, the archaeologist states that some of these sites are so large, you can see them from space. There's so much waiting to be found. It's really just mind boggling. Uh, and of course, uh, so it, and, and, you know, this, and of course, the Luwian territory is extremely wet, rich. It's rich in minerals and metals and oral deposit, or deposit, excuse me. And, uh, so that, you know, it's a flourishing area. Luwians assimilated the great characteristics of Hittite civilization at, at some points. Uh, they have a mixed uh, belief system. Uh, let's take a look uh, just briefly at some of the deities. Let's go to the pictures quickly. Oh, go one back. Oh, oh yeah, one back. Oh, don't worry about it. Let's, let's stay there. So um, this this particular deity, it's it's kind of kind of small. Uh, this is Telepanu. This is the exalted sun, uh, who is a god of agriculture, uh, uh, perhaps even intended to embody the crops, but also having to do with the weather in relation to the crops. The son of Tarhun. Uh, let's go to the next one. You have, of course, Kamru Sepa, is the Luwian and Hittite goddess of healing, medicine, and magic. Uh, the mother of Aruna. Uh, so, and of course, we also have uh, Arma, uh, who is the moon god that apparently they decided not to worship. Okay, you can put, put those down. That was kind of cool. Also, of course, the lead god is, is Tarhun, uh, which, of course, is connected to Tishub. Uh, Tarhun is often shown holding an axe, often a double-headed axe or even a mace, and in the other hand, welding a triple thunderbolt. Uh, connected to Kronos and Zeus and Uranus and all the other kinds of father gods. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, so just kind of an idea. Uh, I do an entire talk, a deep talk, a long talk on uh, Luwian religion. So please refer to that because I go into detail about their belief system. I go into their rituals, which are very much uh, into uh, uh, portals and thresholds and openings of all different types. Uh, we also have a large amount of writings by, by Luwian priestesses. So I do have that all. So if you want to hear that, uh, please do. Okay. So let's go into World War Zero. Now, while the Sea Peoples appeared to be one of the main causes for the fall of the late Bronze Age cultures about the Mediterranean, I still would be remiss not to mention there are other aspects that contributed uh, to this uh, this environment, to this uh, this kind of context of time. 
And so, of course, uh, some of these I'm going to mention uh, some of these calamities. Occur, most of them occur between uh, 1225 to 1175 BCE. Uh, so, what are some of the reasons? Well, uh, Eric Klein, um, uh, who is the the former chair of the Department of Classical Near Eastern Languages at George Washington University, and who also wrote an article for me in Sacred History Magazine a few years ago, uh, talks about the fact that uh, uh, he says that uh, uh, that uh, here he goes uh, that the main thesis is basically it having to be a perfect storm for these uh, these various events at the, the threshold of the end of the late Bronze Age civilization. There is both direct and circumstantial evidence that there was a climate change, drought and famine, earthquakes, invasions, internal rebellions, all happening at the same time. Uh, it, so, you know, all this happening at the same time. Of course, these, he says, I would rank them in the specific order of importance, climate change, drought and famine, and earthquakes. Uh, but uh, let's keep going on. So another, uh, so let's talk about, let's talk about the famine. Let's go there. I'm going to drink some water here because I need it. And we're running out of water. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Hopefully it's the, the water of memory and not the, the, the waters of lay, the forgetfulness. So just won't only remember my name after a while, right? Okay, so let's talk about these things. Okay, so basically there was a series of severe droughts. Uh, this had been happening uh, over a period of time, starting around 1250, however, uh, ending around 1100 BCE. And so uh, we, we know, according to Rolf Smith, these... When I say 1250 to 1100 BCE, uh, Smith says these are fairly precise dates. How come? Because it comes from core samples that are drilled into the sediments at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the drill core extended 18 meters into the seabed and cut across a range of sediments deposited over the last 9,000 years. And also, in fact, by studying the pollen samples taken at 40-year intervals, the scientists were able to monitor changes in the vegetation. And these pollen grains are literally footprints of plants uh, that are extremely helpful in reconstructing. We can, of course, uh, carbon date these. We can see What's going on when it comes to the weather, right? And what kinds of trees are, are thriving? What kind of natural vegetation is going on? And we realize that at this period of time, uh, between 1250 to 1100 BCE, things are dying out. Things are being devastated. Plants are not as diversified. There's not as much pollen or diversification of pollen in the air. Uh, so this is a long drought. Another reason for the decline of the late Bronze Age civilization was a series of devastating earthquakes that rocked the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so we have this uh, going on, uh, and, and, and we, we say have evidence of various cities being knocked apart, uh, looking like dominoes, and then one of the mo most obvious reasons for the collapse was the advent of iron, which, of course, ended the Bronze Age and provided groups outside of the main civilizations in the Mediterranean basin with a military advantage that they ordinarily would not have. So iron proved to be a great resource for these outsiders to be able to fight against uh, the status quo of the great civilizations. The first production of iron uh, appears in Eastern Europe, specifically in Bulgaria and Romania between the 13th and 12th uh, centuries, and then gradually moves eastward. It turns out, however, that the Luwians get a hold of this iron and they will use it uh, for their weapons and their you know, helmets and so forth. So, yes. This does greatly facilitate them. 
So, and of course, obviously, um, so these are some of the reasons. Uh, we'd also, according to the mice, uh, Mycenaean linear B tablets discovered at Pilos, revealed that mercenaries were increasing their activities all about the Mediterranean. The agency became suddenly a very violent place with slave raiders now going up and down the coasts and, and along the islands looking for their victims. Meanwhile, various migratory peoples were on the move because, hello, uh, the harvests were going very well uh, because we have this climate change. So it's a mixture between pirates uh, and migrants going about. In 1208, BCE, the Sea Peoples combined their forces, well, now we know who they are, with the Libyans to the west and met the Egyptian navy with their combined forces at a place known as Perer at the edge of the Nile Delta, as recorded in the Mernative Stele. So let's take a look at that Stele right now. I have a picture of it. So 1208, as I said, here is the Mernative Stele. According to the inscription concerning the conflict here, um, that uh, those he fought against, including the Iquash, the Teresh, the Luca, the Sheridan, the Sheiklesh, and it says northerners coming from all lands. All right, so there's another inscription. There's the Luca. Next he states, the wretched fallen chief of Libya, Merni, son of dead, has fallen upon the country of Tahuni with his bowman Sheridan, Shiklos, Ikwash, Luka, Teresh, taken the best of every warrior and every man of war of his country. He has brought his wife and his children, leaders of the camp, and he has reached the western boundary in the field of Perer. According uh, to this, uh, the stele, his majesty was enraged at the report like a lion. That night, Meretep dreamed of Ta, handing him a sword and saying, Take thou and banish thou the fearless heart from thee. Ta also speaks about the prince of Libya, saying, All his crimes shall be collected and shall fall back upon his head. He shall be given into the lands of Meretep, the hand of Meretep, that he may cause him to spit out what he has swallowed as a crocodile. As the hastener brings up the hastening, the Lord shall seize him and he may know his power. Amon shall bind him with his hand and give him over to his Ka and Hermoth, king of upper and lower Egypt, Menotop. Great joy shall rule in Keratnet. You get the idea. Um, of course, Meritus forces supposedly killed 6,000 soldiers and took 9,000 prisoners. Wishing to be exacting about how many he killed, he cut off the um, private members of all the uncircumcised enemy dead because Egyptians were always circumcised. So they could tell if you're, if you're circumcised, sorry, so the Egyptians, excuse me, were, were um, circumcised. So they can always tell that uh, the, the enemy, they are the uncircumcised. So they did the old cutting up part. Uh, while he cut off the hands of all the circumcised, those people were the traitors. Uh, so there you have it. The Merit of Stele also refers to the devastation of the Levin area. Uh, so you have a mention uh, of Israel. In fact, it says, um, I'll just read this part here and keep going. It says, Devastation, devastated is Tanu, Ketan is quieted, seized is Canaan, that's the word Canaan, with every evil, led away is Ashkelon, taken is Gezer, Yonom has brought to naught, the people of Israel is laid waste, their crops are not, Israel has been wiped out, its seed is no more, Kor, which, by the way, is the word for Palestine, has become as a widow for Egypt. All lands together, they are in peace. Everyone who roamed about is punished by King Meretip, gift with life like the sun every day. So it's interesting, you have the, you have the designation of Israel and Palestine together and Canaan also connected. That seems to have some connections with current events. Around, um, so there you have it. Thank you for showing that. Around 1200 BCE, 
the Mycenaeans began to fall to the Sea Peoples, all about the Aegean. Although uh, we're going to be talking about some other theories of why uh, they fall. Uh, soon the attacks from the Sea People arrived against the Mycenaeans, although some people will say that it's it's the Mycenaeans fighting the Mycenaeans. Uh, we'll go into that. The palace of Pelos was destroyed by an invasion from the sea in approximately 1200 BCE, with many of the Linear B tablets found here uh, describing preparations for the attack. The first attack involved uh, uh, attacks on priests, but no burning, according to the uh, uh, the primary sources. The scribes had a chance to write about it before the second attack that destroyed the palace. The tablet reads as follows. The enemy grabbed all the priests from everywhere and without reason murdered them secretly by simply drowning. I am calling out to my descendants for the sake of history, I am told that the northern strangers continued their terrible attack, terrorizing and plundering until a short time ago. So there you have a reference there. Uh, there's also a reference to uh, people who are command of various ships uh, as well as, um, and so goes into uh, the command of Malius at Awato and designated various ships to various locations and telling, giving lists of how many people uh, who are rowers. In one case, a number is 443 rowers, crews for at least 15 ships, it says. So interesting stuff. Uh, so it looks like there is this mass evacuation uh, that is going on. Now, according to Greek legends, the Mycenaeans of the Trojan War fame were replaced by Dorian invaders from the north who are only half civilized. So that's possibly a reason for it. Still, the archaeological evidence demonstrates that while the Mycenaeans were destroyed, um, we're not sure exactly who destroyed them. Some will say that it was the Sea Peoples. Some will say that it was actually the Mycenaeans. Some people even say that the Sea People joined the Mycenaeans because we noted a word for the Mycenaeans, equash, right, in the lists uh, in Egypt. So, yeah, it looks like some Mycenaeans who are just kind of half pirates could be attacking their own. Who knows? Okay, so, so let's figure out this story. Well, we do. We're now starting to piece it together. And we're going to piece this together little by little. And so, I, Margie, I want you to go ahead, turn, uh, go on and show the, the image the next. So let's talk about this. So you may want to take a screenshot of this because this is basically what, what happened. This is what happened. So you're going to see, um, you see right there, you see the Luwians right there. And look, you can see them all there. You got the Luca there. You got the Arzawa, the Carians. You got the, the Sheridan, the Mysians, the Siha River Valley area. Uh, you have the Trojans, the Tikar, or the Walusians, right? You see them all there. Uh, everybody that is uh, that goes all the way to lower lands, all those are Luwians. Those are Luwian peoples uh, under their different designations. What you see in the purple, I'm kind of colorblind, so I'm hoping that's purple. Uh, those are the Greeks, right? Those are the Greeks. Okay, so uh, here we go. So we now are putting together that when it comes to the fall of the, uh, of the Bronze Age, it happened uh, in three stages. Here we go. And of course, this is ascribed not only by Ibrahim Zeniger, um, who is the archaeologist, but also uh, now taking hold uh, because of the proponents of so much evidence uh, by a large portion of those in Luvian studies today. Uh, so what happened? So these, I'll give you the rough draft of these, what happens, the three steps, and then we'll go into detail of each one. Okay, so the first is the so-called Sea People invasion. It took place during which the navy of the allied Luwian petty states from the Aegean region advanced to the southeast. Uh, I'll go to the second and the third, and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go back to the first one again. 
the second phase is the Luwians who had arrived from the eastern shores uh, of the Aegean Sea were then attacked a few years later by Greek forces. And this is memorialized in the tradition of the so-called Trojan War. So the second stage is, is that <laughs> the Luwians attack, you know, they, they, they spread out, uh, they, they attack the Middle East, uh, they go down uh, into Egypt, they, there's this, like this wave of them that's moving across. The next stage is, is that the, the Greeks will, will then attack the Luwians. The third stage is the civil war. So without any external influences broke out in Greece. So you have an external war, a civil war going on. So these are the three stages. So let's begin with the first step. Where the so-called, where the invasion, sea people invasions took place. So you have this navy, uh, an alliance of Luwian petty states uh, from the Aegean region. And they're advancing, as you can see, uh, to the southeast. Soon afterwards, around 1200 BCE, these sea people, inclusive of the Luwians, began to uh, also uh, uh, move uh, towards, of course, obviously deeply into Egypt, uh, actually a little bit before that time. Uh, so you can see that connection there. But what is the trigger for this? What is the trigger? One of the triggers for the Luwians to rethink their vassalage with the Hittites was uh, happened to be that the Hittites decided to invade and conquer Cyprus, which is you see there as Alisea. Uh, so uh, let's temporarily take down the image so you can see me, but we'll put it back up again. So what happened is this. Uh, the, the Luwians, they have access to all this copper in Cyprus, uh, and it's lucrative. Uh, they are not just pirates; they are merchants, right? And and I and and so so this so copper is is important. Well, Hittite greed, uh, Tudahila the uh, fourth. What he does. Uh, is that uh, he wanted to secure the copper ore reserves uh, in Cyprus. And so what he does is he attacks and fights through Luwian territory in the south along the southern coast of, of, um, of Anatolia, and he cuts right to Cyprus, and he seizes Cyprus. Well, uh, now the, that's a problem. Uh, so because the Luwians need Cyprus for their economy, it's important to them. Now they're cut off uh, from this profitable trade. And also the Cyprians were, were valued uh, trading partners. And so they were determined to win back Cyprus. So the Luwians united themselves into a military alliance, built a fleet, and then began to attack the Hittite forces all along the coast, moving towards Cyprus and then on to Syria. Soon they began to attract other mercenaries, <coughs> and so eventually became the Sea Peoples, as one by one, more were added to that group. As the Hittites were forced to fight a series of naval battles, many of them even draws, a certain king, uh, Supaluma II, sent his army south to attack the Luwians by land, and many of his loyal vassal states from further east joined him, supplying men and chariots and ships, including the king of Ugarit. But this only made situations escalate further, as now that the Hittite forces were focused on the south, groups joined the sea people from the north as well as those known as the Casca, as his capital of Hattusas was left vulnerable. So what happens is, is that he's focusing on the south. Now his capital is vulnerable. It's open to attack. 
got it. <clears throat> now, in one of the last inscriptions from Hattusas, uh, Sepo Lumna II, uh, uh, 1207 to 1178 BCE, he posts, <laughs> he posts, he boasts how he defeated the attackers arriving from Cyprus. <laughs> Famous last words that he calls Alicia. He says, I, Sapolumna, the great king, immediately reached the sea. The ships of Alicia, which is, of course, a Cyprus, met me in the sea three times for battle. And I smote them, and I seized the ships, and I set fire to them in the sea. But when I arrived on dry land, the enemies from Alisa came in multitudes against me for battle. Unfortunately, the great Hittite capital of Hattusa was sacked and it was destroyed around 1190 BCE. So the Hittites are falling, right? Now around 1178, Sapolumna II, king of the Hittites, was defeated with some saying he was killed in battle, while others saying he simply vanished. Uh, at this point, a certain uh, Kuze Teshu uh, claimed the succession to the Hittite Empire, uh, but really, uh, this, this is the beginning of the Neo-Hittites. The power of the Hittites are over. The sea people basically dismantled them. Uh, so, after defeating... Uh, the uh, uh, after the Luwian Sea Peoples, along with others joining their cause, uh, defeated uh, the Hittite Empire. These marauders continued on to Syria and Canaan. Soon, the kingdoms of Alaka and Amuri and the city of Hatsor were destroyed. We have the archaeological evidence to prove that. Oh, by the way, in fact, uh, in fact, we have evidence to show that that they're already. Uh, attacking during the 1190s. Uh, so, in fact, let's talk about Ugarat. Ugarat is in northern Syria. When a certain Amurapi was king of the city, uh, he's a contemporary, uh, Suplomunus II. Um, during this period of time, the city is destroyed. We can actually, by the way, this is fun. I, I don't know if you want to hear this. We actually know the exact date when Ugra was destroyed, we can determine how. Uh, well, one of the there's a tablet uh, that was referring to a total eclipse of the sun at midday, with the line of the central shadow running to, kind of between Libya and towards Cyprus. We can calculate based upon this measure and the fact that. This document written by the scribe was supposed to be deposited, given to, to the royal uh, palace, but never got there because the city got destroyed. So we know it's that day. We can determine that this destruction of Ugarat happened on January 21st, 1192 BCE. <laughs> Isn't that great? He's, so uh, he's, because the scribe, you know, he wanted to send this on and it mentioned the fact that it never got sent on to the royal palace. There's a few letters that survive uh, from this impending destruction uh, with King Amurapi of Ugarat warning uh, Ishuara, the grand supervisor of the kingdom of Alishia, which of course is Cyprus, uh, that a fleet of 20 ships was seen. This, of course, would be the force uh, Luwians sent off to retake the island from the Hittites, now further strengthened because of their Sea People Coalition. Ishawara immediately wrote back asking Amurapi of Ugarat where exactly was his fleet spotted and also asked him where his forces were so he could help him. Next, the king of Alishawa and Cyprus wrote for help from Ugarat, but the Sea People had already overrun Amurapi's kingdom, and he responded to the kingdom of Cyprus as follows. He says, My father, behold, the enemy ships. Oh, by the way, I meant the other ships coming to, uh, I meant that uh, uh, coming to um, um, Ugarat. He's all, uh, My father, behold, the enemy ships come here. My cities were burned, and they did evil things in my country. 
Does not my father know that all my troops and chariots are in the land of Hati, and all my ships are in the land of Luca? Thus the country is abandoned to itself. May my father know it. The seven ships of the enemy that came here inflicted much damage upon us. Unquote. And so basically uh, you have a situation where the the, 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 uh, the Luca, right? I don't know, right? The Luca, uh, the, the, the Luwins, uh, what they're doing uh, is they're, they're attacking Cyprus on one side, right? Uh, with this, this great uh, fleet uh, that was spotted. Uh, and they're also attacking Ugroth at the same time. And so you have uh, striking at once, chaos. And yet <laughs> um, the forces, uh, you know, he sent uh, the, the Ugarot king sent his forces uh, to help Cyprus. So he has no defense. <laughs> it's over. Uh, so uh, meanwhile, uh, let's keep going on here. Uh, the Ugarat archives revealed that uh, Amurapi of Ugarat had earlier asked the Viceroy of Kerkemish for help from the Sea Peoples, but the Viceroy responded, As for what you, Amurapi, have written to me, ships of the enemy have been seen at sea. Well, you must remain firm, indeed, for your part. Where are your troops, your chariots stationed? Are they not stationed near you? No, behind the enemy who press upon you? Surround your towns and ramparts. Have your troops and chariots entered there and await the enemy with great resolution? <laughs> no. <laughs> Unfortunately, Amurapi's troops and ships were committed, as you heard in the other letter, to the Hittites. And so it appears they did not expect a simultaneous attack by the sea peoples of both the Hittite Empire and the coast of Syria and the Levant all at once, around 1192. Wow. Okay, so we're getting a lot of information here. I thought we don't know about the sea people. Well, it looks like we know everything, right? Let's keep on going. Soon the sea people, known as the Peleshot, entered into southern Canaan and seized what is known as the Gaza Strip to eventually become known as the Philistines. Now, based on the horizons of destruction in Syria and Palestine, the Sea People invasions can now be precisely dated. Uh, we can see that they, they actually came a little bit earlier uh, in the Egyptian city of Tel Afar, a storage vessel marked with a cartouche of Seti II was found and shows that this attack happened around 1200. Now take a look at this. So you have uh, attacks going on all at the same time. The Hittites in Syria and the Levant so it is chaos. So I want you to picture just all these these sea people coming from all different areas. You can see, you can see where this paranoia comes comes about. All right. So um, so what happens now is 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 that this is the first phase, the first phase. What's the second phase? So let's get to the next picture, the next map. Thank you. So the next one, the second is the Luwians. You know, we're pretty confident. <clears throat> we we think about the Luwians. I mean, the best land in all of Anatolia, with with the greatest uh, river valleys and it's fertile, it's full of minerals, all that wonderful stuff. It's all in Western Anatolia. So the thing is, the Luwians have the best territory. They have the best territory. Uh, the Hittites, you know, it's, it's not too bad in Central Anatolia. But uh, they have the best area, so so they are in the position of becoming uh, a if they become united, becoming a great empire, better. I mean, stronger than even uh, the, the the Hittites. They have that potential. Do you think the Greeks want that? No. So the Greeks, uh, while they, as many of them being the Sea Peoples, are kind of trying to organize themselves, it's at that time, many scholars say, that there will be an attack. And this, of course, will be connected to what's known as the Trojan War. 
So it appears that the Luwians did not initially attack the Mycenaean kingdoms on the Greek mainland, but only those in regions located directly near trade access ways that they wished to secure. It also appears that some Mycenaean ports of call on the coast of Western Asia Minor, especially Miletus, uh, may have changed sides. But in general, the Greeks had no clear reason to intervene. They're not attacking them uh, that happened to be in the West. They're attacking the East. However, both the access to the Black Sea region as well as the connection through Cyprus and Syria to Mesopotamia, were now all under Louis control. That is a problem. The Greeks don't like that. They, you know, I mean, they have a considerable access to mineral resources and arable land uh, and trade routes. And so, and they knew, they knew if they didn't attack the Louisians now, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna form a stronger coalition later on, and so the best way is knock them right when they're in victory. And so what happens is that uh, uh, supposedly, of course, that we have the Trojan War story, uh, you know, deploying uh, you know uh, one thousand two hundred uh, ships, and they focused on the city of Troy. So let's go to the next image. There we go. So they focus on Troy. Um, and there is evidence that this is just what they did. Uh, you can see that uh, Troy is is a very, it, it commands uh, these straits here. Let's go to the next image. Get my idea there. So what happens is Troy is, is located along, along the Dardanelles, and it's the axis point between uh, the Black Sea to the north, and the Aegean Sea, and then onto the Mediterranean to the south. So you saw by that narrow bit of, 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 of uh, opening there that Troy commands uh, a very important position, but it is always contested. As you saw, it was a Luwian site. Uh, then eventually, you're going to have uh, the, uh, the the Hittites wanting to take it and they claim to have it at one point then they lose it again it becomes luian and then uh the mycenaeans take it and they have it for a period of time and then the mycenaeans lose it and it becomes luian again and then apparently the mycenaeans gain it again <laughs> and kick out a uh, warmu <laughs> and then uh then the luians gain it back but in this case again with hittite uh, support. So it is really back and forth. So why is Troy so important? Well, if you understand currents, the currents go in a southern direction. That means the water is flowing from the Black Sea through the Straits and into the Mediterranean. Uh, as you realize, a lot of the winds are going that direction too. And so that means you got to row. You got to row uh, up through these straits. Well, guess what? Your arms are going to get tired after a while. So you're going to have to stop. Well, Troy is the most convenient place to stop. Of course, uh, Troy is going to ask for a little bit of a, an incentive, right? You're going to have to uh, uh, pay something, right? You pay a toll. Okay, you can close up the site. So you see, you get the idea there. Uh, so there is, you got some harbors there that you can, you can utilize. Uh, it's a great piece of property. So thank you, Margie. So so that's why they want it. Uh, so it's not fighting over Helen. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fighting over, uh, uh, you know, this, this trade route. That's all important. And the Mycenaeans want it. Uh, and that's the beginning of their attempt to dismantle uh, the Luvians uh, and uh, what they perceive as a possible rival. Okay, so um, so uh, now although the Mycenaean Greeks ultimately prevailed against the Luwians, even by capturing Troy, uh, unfortunately, um, when they come home. <laughs> so what happens is that uh, 
Well, their wives and less competent deputies had taken over their thrones back at home. And so what will happen is we get to the third phase. And the third phase and the final phase uh, is a civil war. So you're going to have a civil war going on uh, amongst themselves. And so in many cases, uh, it is complete anarchy. And you're going to have a few of the Mycenaean cities. Uh, they, they, I mean, most of them will fall. A few will survive. But within, within about 50, 60 years, they're all gone. And so this is just the end of it all. So, uh, and there's, there's evidence of, of internal chaos uh, going. You know, of course, earlier on, we see that uh, already in the 1240s, 1230s, you're having the Mycenaeans spend a lot of money in trying to fortify their site. So there's already a threat going there, but uh, it's not cost effective after a while. Well, we're almost through. What happens, of course, is they, the sea people still keep on going. So uh, even though uh, you're having this attack on the, on the, on the, the Luwians in Anatolia, it looks like that you still have uh, the sea people. They're coming back with a vengeance, uh, especially uh, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, we see this uh, uh, during the reign. Sorry, I'm shuffling here. Uh, here we go to Aramses III, who was Pharaoh, who ruled between 1186 to 1155. Uh, the sea people are coming back. They're coming back with a vengeance. But it's interesting because um, there's different names with them. You have the Denyan, you have the Tikir, you have the Wishkish, and we have the Peliset being mentioned. Now, what happens is, is the Denyan, they seem to be from northern Syria. So it looks like this way of the Sea Peoples are not completely Luwian. You got those from northern Syria. Now, the Tekter, uh, spelled T-J-E-K-E-R, many say that they are from Troad region or Walusa, but others say they're maybe from um, Cyprus. So there's a kind of conflict going on here. As far as the Peliset are concerned, the Peliset uh, are oftentimes connected to uh, uh, the area of, uh, of, uh, of the Gaza Strip region. So, so we're seeing a different form. So you have you're following here. So at first, you have the Luwian dominated sea peoples, and they're the ones uh, that that move uh, from uh, going from west to east. They sweep across. They do attack. At, they destroy the Hittites. Uh, they do continue on. They move into uh, much of the Fertile Crescent region. They take Ugarat and the others, and they they also attack Egypt, and that's that wave. And then you have the attack uh, by the Greeks upon them, and it just kind of puts them in disarray. But then the Greeks have their own civil war, and it looks like this marauding culture keep, keeps on going. But now a lot of the sea people uh, are coming from not the Luwian lands, but are coming from the coastal Levant region, and they're moving down there. Isn't that fascinating? Which blink brings us to the Peliset, and I know you want to hear about the Peliset. So here we go. The Peliset, they originated uh, from either the Mycenaean regions or Anatolia, but they will become known as the Philistines. They established uh, five principal cities, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Goth, and Gaza. With that said, there is still evidence of Egyptian influence in the material culture uh, at this time revealing that for a while, Egypt retained some influence over the coastal region. Not long afterwards, the Philistines began to blend with local population. By the end of the 12th century, the Philistines gained their independence from the Egyptians. Um, a 11th century Luwian inscription, Luwian inscription from Aleppo, northern Syria, provides evidence of their importance in the next century because uh, it mentions them uh, uh, by name. Uh, for the 12th to 11th century, uh, uh, the pottery resembles that 
that is found in Crete with various Mycenaean accents. So many people will say that this region, which is now the Gaza Strip, which seems to be, and the word, of course, Peliset, will eventually become the word Palestine. That got your attention, right? Ooh. Some scholars believe that maybe the Peliset migrated with the Mycenaean Greeks to the region, and the two um, and the two had already blended as one upon Crete. Uh, some will say uh, that they're not Luwians at all, but they are Greeks. Uh, it's all up in the air. We don't know for a fact. According to Israeli archaeologists, uh, they look at this and they say that they are Mycenaean Greeks, uh, but of course they would. Uh, but it appears that the, that the Philistines are mixed people that is inclusive of Mycenaean Greek elements, as well as possible Luwian and Cypriotic evidence, uh, bits and pieces. Okay, so the Sea Peoples, what they do is that they, uh, uh, during the time of this Pharaoh, of Ramses III, uh, that they, they, they uh, around 1179, uh, they decide to sail up the Nile River. There's no denial about it. Now, while the sea people had the naval advantage while out at sea because of the configuration of their vessels, the Egyptians had the advantage when it came to military engagement on the rivers with their smaller vessels more maneuverable because they used both sails and oars. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, they uh, what happens is they are armed with grappling hooks. And so the Egyptians began to capsize their vessels one by one using these grappling hooks. According to the Midianet inscription uh, from the time of Ramses III, it says, now the northern countries, which were in the islands, so the islands were quivering in their bodies. So the islands, that seems to be referring to Cyprus, uh, Crete possibly, maybe a misunderstanding of the coast of, of Asia Minor or Anatolia. They penetrated the channels of the river mouths which is the Nile Delta, they struggle for breath, their nostrils cease. His majesty has gone out like a whirlwind against them, fighting on the battlefield like a runner. The dread of him and the terror have entered their bodies. They are capsized and overthrown where they are. Their heart is taken away and their soul is flown away. Their weapons are scattered upon the sea. According to Ramses III, he then conquered the sea peoples and made them subject to Egypt, settling them specifically in southern Canaan. Uh, so many people say that this is the Peliset. Uh, this is uh, those are in Canaan, and which becomes Philistia. But of course, again, uh, it is a very controversial point. So, um, so what does happen though? I'm going to end on a few things. I know we're kind of going over, over time. What does happen is that the new kingdom of Egypt will never be the state. Uh, the sea peoples really did weaken the new kingdom until it just peters out uh, going into the 10 hundreds of BCE and it's, 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 it's gone. So, what will happen, of course, is that uh, civilization does fall. But let's talk about this. This is where I want to conclude. You know, I have to say, Egypt, you know, it's monolithic. It's amazing. It has a few innovations. But it had become oversatisfied with itself. So it became fat in a sense of its own upon its own prosperity. The Hittites, uh, you know, they had a good run for about 400 years, but they too, even though they seemed to be at the height of power uh, during the 13 into the 1200s, they too showed signs of stagnation. They were very non-inclusive. Uh, once again, they became very prideful of their position and their power. Kind of hubris between the two. And they're fighting these battles, the Hittites and the Egyptians between each other. 
but you now you have a peace treaty and they just kind of sat there waiting stagnating nothing that's dynamic going on the mycenaeans you know the mycenaeans let's be honest if you know the history of mycenaeans i have a whole talk on the mycenaeans so i don't have time to go into that in detail the mycenaeans they're not the minoans and in many ways they're still kind of like pirates they are the mycenaeans they are you know they're they're under their various uh, local annexes, and they go out there and they pillage and steal and kill. I mean, just read and spend time in Greek mythology, for heaven's sakes, during this so-called heroic age, and you realize glorified pirates. Sure, they're partly civilized, but they still have this tendency, you know. And so the Mycenaeans, uh, they were also, in a sense, stagnating uh, in many ways. So. Even though you have the fall and you have this dark age that lasts for 400 years, and it is a period of chaos, it's terrible. But I kind of look at it like this. You got, you got, basically, you have a chess game, and you know all the parts. You know all the players. You have it all figured out. You know all the typical moves that are going on. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the Bronze Age, somebody goes like this to the board. They go, they wipe it clean. And it wipes it clean for something else to take over. Well, what? Because what takes over from here is what changes our civilization. What do you mean? Let's take a look. Wipe clean. This allows, of course, Israel to to gain power remember the the egyptians had they had they owned uh the region of of of, of israel you guys know that right they owned it it was theirs <laughs> you know they they had the you know you saw the map between the two uh did you see any israel there did you see any you no know, no no because they owned it uh, you go to Beth Shen, you discover what? There are Egyptian ruins at Beth Shen, south of the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, they're there. Uh, you can see obelisks there and Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, pottery and, and architecture and, 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 you know, and statues and everything else. The Egyptians had it. See, long story story, which I'll be real brief about it, don't, don't worry, is that what will happen uh, is that you have during the second intermediate period, you have the Egyptians being attacked by the Hyksos, who are from this region of Palestine. They're from this area of the Levant. And they attacked and they owned Egypt for that time. Well, the Egyptians uh, then attack back, uh, and that is the new kingdom. But not only do they stop uh, the, the Hyksos, but what they did is they attacked the realm of the Hyksos which is in the Levant, the southern part of the Levant, and they continue moving all the way up through Jerusalem and all the way up uh, to uh, what is now known as the Jezreel Valley, which is, of course, Armageddon, right? So they had that, and they held that during the New Kingdom all the way through, and even through, of course, the time of, of Ramses and everything else, all the way to until, guess who broke that power? It was the Sea People. The Sea People broke that hold over the area of the Levant, and as a result of that, the empty space, there was the allowance for Israel to come about. As a result of that, of course, uh, you have the beginning of, of course, you know, obviously uh, Judaism and moving through, and then, of course, Judaism will lead to Christianity. You get the rest of the story. So you don't have that without this. You got to clean the slate. It's not just Israel, however. The other part is, is that uh, um, this region is now open. The, the coastline uh, of Syria, Lebanon is open. And so there are those who were, some were sea peoples and others were those who had escaped the destruction of the great uh, city states uh, of the, uh, the Near East. And they went to the coastal areas and they became the Phoenicians. And so the Phoenicians were able to come about. 
Why is that important? Well, the Phoenicians were able to come about, and that led to, well, our writing system, <laughs> phonetic letters. So we get our alphabet from them. So you get the Phoenicians, uh, you get Israel. What else do you get from that? Well, you get uh, you get the Greeks, right? You get, the, of course, you have the Dark Age, the Homeric era, but then you have the Greeks. And it's interesting. And I should have shown this picture, but oh, it's okay. Um, what we also get from this is that um, a little bit trivia. You guys know that those in mainland Greece at first didn't come up with hardly any ideas, major ideas that are impactful for, for civilization. You guys know that um, uh, when the Greeks settled the Ionian coast, when they settled there, that's where all these ideas, major ideas and philosophies come from. It didn't come from mainland Greece. Mainland Greece was isolated. It had, it had, you know, it had these, this really rough topography, and these city-states were, were in there in, in between uh, these these valleys and they're all cut off so they kind of they're kind of more isolationist these city states were very much separate from the rest but when they when the greek settlers arrived in in the western part of, of anatolia you have these great roads you have these river valleys you have trade you have and so you have a whole bunch of cities that pop up that interact with the rest of the world, where there's lack, there's no isolation. So ideas are flooding in into uh, Western Anatolia that will become known as Western Asia Minor uh, from everywhere, from everywhere, from uh, from um, uh, going into, of course, obviously the Middle East, uh, going up the Royal Highway from Egypt, uh, going uh, from uh, Parthia, going even from India, all these ideas, in fact, you have what's called the Royal Road, which was built by the Persians. And the Royal Road, obviously, what it does is it starts at Ephesus, and then it, when it goes, it goes to Susa. This road has 111 postal stations, 111 postal stations using the Pony Express. And by using that, it only took two weeks to get a message from Ephesus along the Aegean all the way to Susa uh, in, in the area of, of Persia. And it took another week or week and a half to go to India from there. So communication is pretty quick. Philosophers came down these roads. And so philosophy starts, guess where? Not in mainland Greece. It starts where? At Miletus. Miletus, well, Marawa, which is, of course, a Luwian city. And, of course, you have Thales, right? Then, of course, you have Thales from there, uh, Anaximander, Eximenes. And they say, oh, well, who's after that? Oh, yeah, Heraclitus of what? Of Ephesus. Oh, Pythagoras, where is he from? Samos. And what about the father of history? Where is he from? He's from Caria. Helconarsis, right? Uh, history starts again along the coast of, of Asia Minor, which is interesting because a large portion, as we know, it says that the Greeks, when the colonists arrived, many of them were just men, and they took native or indigenous wives. Those indigenous wives are Luwian. So the blood flowing through the veins of many of these innovators and uh, idealists were actually Luwian. <laughs> yeah, and of course, the Luwians were always known to be really wealthy. Uh, why? Name a Luwian that's wealthy. You guys ever heard of the Midas touch? Midas, King Midas? Yeah, you know, you know, Gordian, right? The Phrygians. Whoa, yeah, that's that, those are Luwians, right? What about uh, you know, uh, Croesus of Sardis, the Lydian? Those are Luwians, you know, richest Croesus, the richest man in the entire world, the guy that came up with the coinage. Well, actually, uh, actually, the, the king before him, but we we say him that comes from there too. The wealth resources is all there, so much of civilization is able to happen, which is something I want to bring up because not only the Greeks were able to thrive. But these cultures, who are Luwian cultures, did continue on. Yeah, the Greeks, they attacked the Luwians. You know, they did. Uh, and they succeeded for a little while. Then the Greeks fought amongst themselves. Then the Luwians 
reasserted themselves. And the Luwians became the Lycians. The Lycians are the ones uh, who had a very innovative uh, democratic kind of system that was very influential, uh, even when it comes to modern democracies. Okay, uh, those are the Lycians, right? Oh, what about, uh, of course, obviously the Lydians, uh, the Lydian king. Those are those are Luvians. Those that's the, that's the course King Croesus, right? You know, the rich and and of course Phrygia and so forth. Is this making sense? So it, it turns out that the Luvians thrived. Uh, all the way into, um, they continue to thrive uh, even into the Greek period of time, uh, even into the Hellenistic age, uh, and their cultures continue on even to the Romans, the Luwians. Uh, it's always, always interesting to see that uh, when you have, for example, uh, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, sorry, Peter, when he receives the, the spirit upon him in the book of Acts, he mentions various people. Uh, that he's able to say the languages to, and some of them are Luwian languages. Luwian languages continued on for a very long period of time. So there is much to be said for when a society, a civilization, has outgrown itself, outlived its potential, become complacent, become prideful, hubris, what do you think? And so maybe the story of the Sea Peoples could be a telltale sign, a warning that the world can't end. The world did end for so many people. Civilization was wiped clean. Uh, there are places where, where no civilization replaced anything for 400 years. Nothing. They went from uh, huge cities with writing and great communication systems and great infrastructures and organizations to absolutely nothing, agrarian, people living in the ruins and hovels. So don't think that that cannot happen again. It can happen again. It's a warning sign. But it's also maybe a sign of hope, too, because even after that, the tenacity of the human spirit him out and these other civilizations which still influence us directly today came out to take its place so it is a warning but it is also uh possibly uh a a sign that there still is hope after all well i hope you enjoyed i, I think that that's uh that is the mystery of the sea peoples looks like we know a lot <laughs> and and uh, we know more too but um you know i don't have time to read through all this <laughs> so but you get the idea so next time when you see in the history channel or some other place uh that hey you know the mystery of the sea peoples do we really know we know <laughs> we know a lot <laughs> and a lot of details thank you and have a great night